Welcome back to another episode. I am the Colonialist and this is the ultimate guide to raising a queen and founding colony. These are my personal best practices and methods that I put in place to have a successful queen and colony. So I'm hoping from all the mistakes that I've learned from in the past that you won't make those mistakes and these tips will help you get a head start in raising your colony. If you drop down into the description section of this video, you will find timestamps to the relevant information. If there's anything that I'm covering that you're not currently interested in, have a look at the timestamps and jump ahead to the different subjects that are going to be covered in this ultimate guide. While you're there, I'll be cheeky and ask if you could possibly drop me a like for this content and also a comment to let me know your thoughts on this guide. If you like the content and you want to see more like this and you haven't already, please think about dropping a subscribe and keep and up to date with the latest episodes. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep your hands and legs inside the rides at all time and we're gonna get this started. The most important part in raising an ant queen is understanding the time it takes. From founding queens to first workers, it can take between two to three months for most species. A fully claustral queen should ideally be interacted with on a monthly basis. Now an ant month, is considered to be 28 days and you can often break this down and slightly get away with doing 14 day checks if you can't wait the 28 day rotation. If you look at it this way the more interactions you have with your queen the more times you stress her out the less chances of success that you actually have. Whether you are doing a 14 day rotation or a 28 day rotation the principle is exactly the same. This is the opportunity that you have to feed your claustral founding queen. Now in the wild, they do not feed from the moment of founding until they have their first workers that have been closed and successfully foraged for some food and brought it back for the colony to feed on. In the wild, from studies that have been read, although no solid figure is actually given, it's widely considered that around 60 to 80% of wild colonies fail to found due to the queen not having enough reserves stored to survive the gap that can last two to three months. And also with them being captive, the time frame could have been even longer. She may have consumed batches of brood during transport and this may not be the first batch that she's laid. In my experience, it's best practice for success to take this opportunity to feed a queen that wouldn't normally feed over this period. Your schedule should be slightly changed if you have a semi-claustral queen. These are queens that actually need to forage and hunt for food and possibly bring chunks of protein back for their larvae to feed on. What you do with that rotation is you do it once every seven days. So it's a seven day rotation and you have four interactions a month with your queen. She should ideally be in a tubs and tubes setup. This way she can forage for the food herself and you don't actually need to disturb her as it would be the same as having a colony that has workers with access to an outworld and she can gather that food herself and will be less stressed. I have to drop a disclaimer here. A sad fact of ant keeping is sometimes you can do it all correct and your queen can just pass away. You never know if the queen has any underlying health issues or biological defects. Honestly, there's a vast array of reasons queens can die at this stage and it's not preventable and it is the hardest aspect of getting involved in this hobby. So now we've covered the routine of feeding. I think it's about time that we cover the actual diet and the importance of their diet. If you watched the Ant Holifer channel and you've seen my piece on his show, then you might have already heard some of this information. It's important and it's very easy to make this mistake in the beginning that you do not feed your colony what's considered to be a high protein diet. So that's lots of insects. I will link one of the primary research gate papers that I took most of this information from, but in fact, feeding your founding colony a high protein diet can cause the colony to crash, which is a mass worker die off, or it can even cause the colony to die altogether. This is because in ant biology to adult workers, protein is actually toxic to them and they can build up what's called protein toxicity from having too much protein in their diet that they're unable to filter out because one of the processes that the ant worker does itself is when it consumes the food, it actually processes out the protein specifically to feed that protein to the larvae and the queen. 
if they are fed too much protein and are holding on to it for far too long, this is where they suffer from protein toxicity and this can actually be fatal to that worker. What you want to actually do for better success of raising your colony is to provide a high carbohydrate, low protein diet. Carbohydrates are provided in the form of sugars such as sucrose and fructose, which are the two primary types of sugars that ants consume. In essence, you can never overfeed your colony carbohydrates because every member of the colony, that's the queen, the workers and the larvae, can actually consume carbohydrates without any negative impact. Make sure you just don't stick to one source of carbohydrates. So if you're using honey or sugar or a pre-made mix, then make sure you rotate those. When feeding your colonies, the only thing that should remain available to them 24 seven is fresh water, which you really want to switch out every couple of days. And you can use feeders like this, which are perfect tools to be able to hydrate your colony with fresh water. The most important part of a healthy diet for a founding colony and a founding queen is portion sizing protein properly. And the best method to do this is to basically size the portion of protein to the size of the queen's gaster. One piece that size will feed the queen, one piece that size will feed two larvae. So at this point, all you do is count out the amount of larvae that you have and divide out the correct amount of protein. You really, really, and I want to stress this, do not want to overfeed your colony protein at this stage. I should also add, if you're doing the 14 day rotation, make sure that on one of the 14 day checks, you put in protein and on the next 14 day is carbohydrates. You can do protein and carbohydrates, but make sure that you skip protein on one of those feeds. If you are doing 28 day rotations with your feeding, then provide protein and carbohydrates at the same time, and that should be fine. Try to provide more carbohydrates to last the colony longer over that time. As I said, it won't do them any harm. And you should, as best practice, to remove food 24 to 48 hours after feeding. Maintenance becomes much easier once your colony has its first workers and you've hooked up an outworld and that way your interaction with your colony comes from the outworld and not necessarily the nest. You want to avoid disturbing the nest as much as possible and when I say you're doing your 14 day and 28 day rotations that means in between that time your colony is away in the dark and completely undisturbed with no vibrations, no loud sounds and are nice and quiet so that the queen can just lay and the worker can do their thing. With semi-claustral queens on the seven day rotation, often they actually require higher protein diets due to the way that their larvae feed or the fact that the queens don't have those reserves. On their rotation, it's best practice to provide both carbohydrates and protein for them. The two key factors to this ultimate guide are quite simply this, disturb the colony as little as possible and stick religiously as you can to that 14 day or 28 day rotation with a claustral founding queen and with a semi claustral queen just try not to disturb the actual nest that she's in if you have a tubs and tubes set up connected to an outworld then you can just feed her as you would a normal the second and possibly biggest key factor is the importance of the correct diet and not overfeeding your colony too much protein at this very very critical time of their development I can pretty much guarantee you that the tip about protein is very little known. It's definitely not shared. I haven't personally come across any videos that tell you about the protein. And until my own research that I've been doing recently, I didn't personally know that feeding your colony too much protein at this time could have such fatal effects. It certainly makes it clear to me now that some of my previous mistakes with founding colonies was genuinely probably feeding them too much protein and that's why I ended up losing those colonies. And it is really easy to do. Certainly, there's no massive secrets to successfully raising a colony. They are quite simple but yet effective methods. They are tried and they are definitely tested. If you think there are any more tips or hints that I should have added in this video, please let me know in the comments because it would greatly benefit everyone to hear your thoughts. I hope within the guide that I have managed to pass on some quite valuable information and I hope that you find it useful to raising your colonies and make sure that they're within the best health as possible. As always, it's been an absolute 
pleasure and until next time this is the colonialist signing out